Hansen, co-founder and CEO of SurvivorNet. Good afternoon, thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm Steve Alperin, and the co-founder of SurvivorNet, along with guy Tim Langloss. And we are so grateful to be part of this with The Atlantic again this year. They program these things as thoughtfully and as carefully and with love as any, any conference I've ever been part of, so thank you. Um, for those of you who were meeting for the first time, SurvivorNet is now the leading media company in the country purely focused on cancer information. We're very proud of it. It's very personal for me. Um, like a lot of people in this room, I lost my dad uh, some years ago, um, and our family didn't really get to the right places. My mom is here. She's been practicing law for 60 years, and there's not a lot of walls she doesn't drive through for her family. Cancer was one of them. And we kept meeting people in our family and meeting people like our family, and so I decided to do something about it. Um, in the last year, we feel grateful to have reached millions of people who are hungry, like a lot of people here today, hungry for better information about cancer. The thing that really sticks out to us and that stays with me is the stories of courage and hope. Um, and if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'll tell you a story. Last year after the conference, I was uptown at the plaza and I was standing in the lobby and a woman tapped me on the shoulder and her name was Jessica Malore. And I, she introduced herself and there was something about her. She was radiant in a way that was not normal. And I was trying to say to myself, who is this person who is so happy to be here? And I'm, I'm looking at a, at, a, at a friend of mine in the audience who there was something about her that was amazing. Um, she just passed away and the world lost someone incredible. I talked to her mom last night and I was somewhat reluctant to mention it, except that I think I wanted to start the afternoon, and all of us wanted to start the afternoon, by honoring um, Jessica and honoring folks like her. And the thing that really stayed with me about her is she had a remarkable way of turning extraordinary hardship into opportunity and hope. Um, please, could we roll the tape? I believe that you can choose to live in fear or you can choose to live your life. My name is Jessica Malore and I am a three-time cancer survivor. When I was 16 years old, I was co-captain of my high school tennis team. I was a senior. One night I was out at a restaurant with my family and I started to feel dizzy and lightheaded. And when that subsided, I felt pressure pains going from my chest to my neck and heaviness in my arms. When I initially woke up, I had no idea what had happened to me, and I was told that I would need a heart transplant in order to move on with my life. I was living on this experimental heart assist device, and so I was determined to reclaim my life. That same week, I had to have my left leg amputated because I got an infection in my leg, and it came down to a matter of my leg or my life. And I returned to school, after nine long months, I finally received my life-saving heart transplant a few days before high school graduation. The timing of the transplant was perfect in that it allowed me to attend Princeton University on time three months later. And then the summer after freshman year, I felt a lump on my neck about the size of a quarter. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I was in complete remission by the end of that first semester of sophomore year. Six and a half years after the first lymphoma, I felt another lump on my neck. And after eight months of treatment, I was again in remission. Eight years after my second bout of cancer, I needed to have a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. I've learned never to take my health for granted. So I don't believe in living in fear. It has encouraged me to live life with a certain vividness, to pack my schedule of things and do as many things as I can uh, to make m the most out of life, but also to have the biggest impact that I can have on the world. Because I saw how sharing my journey could help other people, no matter what they had been through in their lives, and giving them a sense of hope and strength and awareness about different issues. Um, not only talking about overcoming adversity, uh, but seeing a challenge and how it could be an opportunity for you to make something positive out of your life.
Jessica was so full of hope. I, I think I was a little reluctant to maybe do this and show that, but it's so important that we remember her. And I think that the hope that she talks about, um, it does need to be grounded in reality and grounded in science. And I think what's really extraordinary and grounded in the sadness uh, that I have in my family and so many of us, but what's really extraordinary about working in and around cancer these days is that it's not optimism entirely that the hope is grounded in what I like to call a slow motion scientific revolution of about a decade. Some of the people who are leading that are here today. Um, and so I think the, the really best thing that, about these kinds of gatherings is that we can get together to move the ball forward a little bit, to understand the science, um, and to have the community together. And most importantly, to let people know, the, the most important people, the patients, that they're not alone. So thank you so much. I hope the afternoon is really interesting. I really appreciate being here. Thanks. For my story, Cancer is Metaphor, please welcome Ibram X. Kendi, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist and the director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ibram Kendi, and it would be easy for me to, to stand up before you and, and, and talk about the fact that African Americans are still more likely to die from most cancers. It'd be easy for me to talk to you about the ongoing debate about why these disparities exist. Is, is it because there's something wrong with African Americans, either biologically or even behaviorally? or is there a problem with our policies and our environment and our society? But I didn't actually come here to talk to you about that. I, I came to talk to you about my own story, uh, my own story with cancer, and, and the way in which, through cancer, I was able to sort of see it as a metaphor for understanding something else. Early part of 2018, in January, I was pretty much ordered by my wife to, to go and get a colonoscopy. I, for, for several months, I had been going to the, to the bathroom and only to not go. For several weeks, I, when I would go, was, was, was basically putting up blood clots. And, and so she, being a pediatric emergency doctor who was a breast cancer survivor herself, pretty much told me when we got back from vacation that we took during New Year's, uh, during the New Year's weekend that I was going to the doctor. But she didn't actually think that it was anything serious. And when I initially went to the nurse who ended up scheduling the colonoscopy, she didn't think there was anything serious. I was 35 years old, I had no risk factors, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I was a vegan, I worked out. But ultimately, I was diagnosed with, with colon cancer on January 10th, 2018. And then the very next day, I learned that I had stage four colon cancer. And what was ironic about that week when I was diagnosed is, is I had already been sort of working on, on an essay, on an essay about racism, uh, on an essay arguing that the heartbeat of racism is denial, and that throughout history, those who have produced racist ideas, those who supported racist policies, had customarily defined themselves and their ideas and policies as not racist, that, that, that denial was essential to racism itself, that, that it was so hard for people to admit the ways in which they're being racist. And, and what was ironic is I was working on that essay in many ways because it took me quite a bit of time to admit that I actually had cancer with no risk factors at 35 years old. I did not want to believe it. I did not want to believe that it was so bad. And what's, what's ironic is when it comes to identifying an American as racist, 
We, we have so many Americans who will say, no, let's not use that term. Let's not identify them in that way. That will hurt them. They don't need to know it's that bad. It will shut down conversation. But when it comes to identifying and diagnosing someone with cancer, we recognize the importance of telling some, someone exactly what they have, exactly what their treatment arguments are. Why? Because we realize that if we do not, they could die. So in other words, by hurting them, we recognize the ways in which we're providing a path to healing them. But when it comes to racism, we, we, we somehow want to heal this country and even hear ourselves of racism without pain, without pain that is, that is essential to healing. And so I was diagnosed with, with stage four cancer. It, it, it took me a while to, as I state, admit that I had it. I didn't want to believe it. I did not want to believe someone like me could have cancer in the way so many Americans want to believe that someone like them can't be racist. And, and so ultimately, I, of course, was allotted a treatment plan. And what's ironic about the way we treat cancer is we actually could treat metastatic racism in the same way. Because we, too, in this country, have metastatic racism. And, 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 and these tumor cells have literally spread to every part of the body politic. And, and what I mean by tumor cells is I'm talking about the, the tumor cells of racial inequity. Because for me, when I see racial inequity, I see racism. When, when other people see racial inequity, they see what's wrong with a particular racial group, which to me means I'm also seeing racism. And so the way in which we treat racism is actually, I should say, the way we treat cancer is the way we can go about treating racism. In other words, we, we can have a local treatment in which we go in and surgically remove our nation's racist policies. How do we know those policies are racist? Because they're creating racial inequity, because they're not leading to racial equity. We can go in and surgically remove those racist policies. In the way doctors went in in August of 2018, two different surgeons to surgically remove my tumors. But, but they didn't stop there. That's not the only treatment that I received. They were also, they wanted to make sure that they shrunk those tumors. They, they wanted to make sure that, that those tumors did not return. So they flooded my body with, with, with chemotherapy for six months, which is, which is equivalent to flooding the body with anti-racist policies. And at the end of the day, I had to believe that despite people with my illness being 88, that 88% 88 of them die in five years, I had to believe that I could overcome cancer in the way that we, as a nation, have to believe we can overcome racism. Thank you. For a conversation on how Medicaid expansion saved lives, please welcome Dr. Blythe Adamson, Senior Quantitative Scientist at Flatiron Health and Dr. Yusuf Safar, Associate Professor of Medicine and Public Policy at Duke Cancer Institute and Sanford School of Public Policy. Here to lead the conversation, welcome Atlantic staff writer, Olga Kazan. Thank you, thank you all. Um, so we've heard all day about uh, exciting breakthroughs in cancer treatment, um, but one thing that often gets overlooked is that you, you can't necessarily get access to treatment unless you have insurance. And one of the most important sources of insurance for low-income people, as many of us know, is Medicaid. And currently, 14 states have still not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this has been going on for years now. States have been slowly rolling it out. Um, and so today we're going to talk a little bit about what the consequences of this lack of Medicaid expansion really is. Um, so first I wanted to start with a, a personal story from you, Yusuf. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your patient, Sylvia, and, and what happened with her? Um, so Sylvia is uh, an example 
I think uh, what happened to Sylvia um, could very much be described by the term that Ibram just used, metastatic racism. Um, I think Sylvia's experience um, was really embedded in what has, and many argue, is a racist policy of non-Medicaid expansion. So I'm a medical oncologist. I treat patients with gastrointestinal cancers, colorectal cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And Sylvia is a patient of mine who was diagnosed with metastatic stage four pancreatic cancer. At the same time that she was diagnosed, as she got sicker, um, she wasn't able to go to work. She lost her job. And with that, her insurance coverage. So Sylvia applied for Medicaid um, in the state of North Carolina, one of those 14 states that has yet to uh, expand um, Medicaid access. She was told that she earns too much to be eligible for Medicaid. Uh, at the time, Sylvia earned $18,000 a year. In order to be eligible for Medicaid in North Carolina, she'd have to drop uh, her annual income to around $8,000 a year. So because she wasn't able to ha uh, gain insurance coverage, she quickly racked up thousands of dollars in medical debt um, very quickly uh, over the course of, of a few weeks um, and was thinking thoughts like, should I eat today or should I go get my cancer treatment? Um, and, and Sylvia, I think, is, is an example of just one patient um, out of many thousands and thousands who have similar experiences um, because of limited access and high cost of care. And what are some of those, so zooming out to the big picture a little bit, what are some of the disparities that we see in cancer outcomes because of a lack of coverage? Um, we see patients um, being diagnosed uh, with later stages of cancer. We're seeing um, patients more likely to die of cancer, of not getting appropriate treatment, all because of um, uh, racial differences at the surface, but really as a result of access. So let me give you an example. There's a really interesting study that looked at risk of dying of prostate cancer uh, among black and white men. So if you look at um, a nationally representative sample of men with prostate cancer, you see that black men are significantly at greater risk of dying of prostate cancer. Now, in the same country, in the U.S., look at a health system where access is at least theoretically, equalized the VA health system, where regardless of race, you should have access to the same health care. In that population, white men and black men are at equal risk of dying of hmm. prostate cancer. So if you e stabilize, equalize the coverage, you equalize the outcomes. Exactly. Some, okay. Well, Blythe, tell us about what you discovered um, when you looked at the data as to how Medicaid expansion can actually improve some of these outcomes. Absolutely. So as a health economist and data scientist at Flatiron Health, I have access to the medical records for more than 2 million cancer patients in the United States. And I had been really frustrated that seeing racial disparities described over and over and over again and not really having any evidence of what tools do we have in policy to make things better. And the Affordable Care Act, you know, Obamacare, it had goals to improve healthcare access, quality, and equity. And so I wanted to design a study with colleagues from Yale and um, other scientists at Flatiron to test this hypothesis of did Medicaid expansion reduce racial disparities? Uh, and we looked at just one specific measure, which was the time from the day you receive this advanced diagnosis of cancer to when you start your first line treatment, when you actually can get, um, the, get the medicine that you need. And what we found was that um, without Medicaid expansion, that white patients were being treated much sooner than black patients with advanced cancer. Hmm. And then we found that when, with Medicaid expansion, that racial disparity was practically eliminated and no longer a significant difference in the timely treatment of black and white patients. Wow, so it actually reduced the disparities. It that. did, and wow. you know, really supports exactly the prostate study example of Veterans Affairs providing equal access. Because this is really, this is the working poor. You know, it's people who are just above the federal poverty line. Yeah. So they're, you know, earning a small income, but do not have this employer-provided health insurance. Yeah. 
Well, and, and you know, cancer, obviously, it's a very expensive uh, condition to treat. Uh, the medications themselves often cost thousands of dollars. I wanted to talk a little bit about financial toxicity, um, this, this term that you have. And, and what is, uh, you know, there's this, this interesting statistic that came out not long ago that something like 42% of cancer patients drain their life savings. Uh, as they recover from cancer, what does that money go toward? Like what, where, uh, you know, if, even if you have insurance, where does, where do you end up spending all that money? Um, that money goes everywhere. <laughs> um, it goes to paying for uh, insurance, for premiums, for deductibles, for co-pays. Um, it goes to paying for transportation, special diets, wigs. Um, it's, it decreases by um, time off work. Mm -hmm. where patients and family members have to take time off work to shuttle their loved one or themselves back and forth to treatment. So what we're seeing more and more is that even though patients have insurance, as you said, that insurance itself is expensive mm -hmm. for patients. Um, the um, median deductible, the amount that you have to pay before your insurance kicks in, is now not in the hundreds of dollars per year, but thousands of dollars per year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you think about it, the median income in the U.S. is uh, in the range of fifty to $60,000 a year. Uh, a few thousand dollars um, is a tremendous amount of money for most of the people in this country. Hmm. And insurers, as you said, are actually shifting some of that cost onto the patient through higher deductibles. Through higher deductibles and co-pays. Overall, the concept is called cost sharing, mm -hmm. where... Cancer is expensive because drugs are getting more expensive. The treatments that we have for our patients are better than they were 10 years ago, but they cost orders of magnitude more than they did 10 years ago. Um, and so insurance companies are now saying, well, we need patients to bear a greater portion of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that cost is getting shifted um, over to uh, patients, and uh, our patients can't afford it. So you live in a non-expansion state and practice in a non-expansion state, North Carolina. Um, what, what are the types of things you hear on the ground from your local legislature when it comes to why the state still has chosen not to expand Medicaid? Well, um, what I'm really fortunate to have in North Carolina is um, actually state leadership that is very much in for, very much for expansion, ironically. So um, our Secretary of Health and Human Services um, has been a huge proponent of Medicaid expansion, um, as is our governor. Unfortunately, in our state legislatures where it gets caught up, and, and uh, you know, I'm not sure specifically in North Carolina, but in any of these states, I think the argument is often, well, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it's a burden to everyone else in the state to help pay for somebody else's health care. Um, and to me, that is not uh, an adequate argument as to why uh, we shouldn't expand access to healthcare. Do you guys say, I mean, you both work on, on obviously really big data sets and, and use data to, you know, help inform policy decisions. Do you think, I, I do feel like we have enough data now to see that Medicaid expansion works. What do you think it's going to take in order to really get the rest of these states to expand? I agree with you. The evidence is there. I mean, we've now entered a time with data where we have access to be able to interpret things in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, historically, we would design a policy with the best intentions, but you know, policies can often have unintended consequences. You know, there can be winners and losers. Mm -hmm. But now we are able to use real-world data to look immediately and see how is this policy affecting racial disparities um, or you know, people of different socioeconomic um, status. So we do have this opportunity now that, to generate evidence for um, you know, e evidence-driven policy. Yeah. It's, it's getting harder and harder to argue against um, broader access uh, to healthcare. Um, in any context. I mean, Blythe study is a great example of that. You get earlier access to cancer treatment. We see resolution of racial disparities. We see resolution of income disparities. Um, the, and, and actually, there are studies that have asked, is there any harm to Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. through overuse of health care? And for the most part, we're not seeing that either. What about the emergency room study in Oregon? <laughs> so, so that was really interesting, right? So, what you're referring to is the Oregon um, Oregon Health Experiment, which was not a part of ACA Medicaid expansion. But what they found was that as they um, they had they had a lottery to lottery patients into expanded Medicaid access, and what they found was that access to emergency room visits 
um, spiked initially. That's ha that happened for a very sad reason, if you think about it, right? These are patients who were afraid to walk through the doors of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they felt that they could. Uh, and so they did. And where did they go first, not having established healthcare anywhere else, was the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Since then, we have seen other studies um, that might counter that, that, that if you establish care, maybe there's an initial spike, but once you establish care, that evens out. Right, and there was like a pent-up need almost for healthcare. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's a similar pent-up need for prevention services too. You know, a, a lot of the racial disparities that we're seeing uh, are a result of um, differences in screening rates or you know, other prevention services, which explains why we're seeing African-American patients being diagnosed at later stages. Yeah. And so as people have more earlier access to care and ability to be screened more, then there'll be, there'll be more equity in their opportunity to be treated early with medicines that can extend their lives. Right. Um, so a cancer is, is such a stressful um, diagnosis to get. How does the, the stress of, how do you see that among your patients, the stress of cost and, and paying for it all, how does that figure into their treatment and their recovery? Um, not being a patient, I can't speak for one. The patients in the room know better than I, but um, I will tell you, I see it in their faces, I see it in their actions. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started in this field of the financial toxicity of cancer, um, it happened because patients were coming to me around the time of the recession, and they were asking me things like, can I get um, a drug that's less expensive? Yeah. Um, no offense, but can I see you less frequently? Huh. Um, and this was all because, despite having insurance, they couldn't afford everything that, that, um, that was happening in, uh, along with their care. Um, there is a great deal of stress that happens that I don't hear about. Hmm. Um, and that's the part that concerns me, because I can't do anything about it if I don't hear about it. And right. finances is only one piece of that. Right, right. Um, well, there is uh, a pr prolonged, protracted election going on, a, you know, presidents, uh, candidates are campaigning and, and trying to come up with the best health policies. If you guys had the ear of the candidates right now, what would you be telling them, what, what would you be advocating for to be in their, in their health policies? Well, I, I can't speak to the politics, but what I've seen from the experiences of, of real cancer patients who are you know, living in the, these times of uncertainty in their health insurance is that if things went back to the way they were and mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act was repealed, that we would absolutely expect racial disparities to worsen over time. And the gains that we had seen in, you know, eliminating racial disparities between black and white patients, getting access to timely cancer treatment, a lot of those gains would probably be depleted. Hmm. You know, um, let's first stick with the Affordable Care Act for a minute. Um, you know, I feel like the Affordable Care Act um, is, was not everything that it was billed to be. I mean, I'll tell you, in full disclosure, um, I am not a Democrat. Um, I'm a socialist, which means that I don't feel like the Affordable Care Act <laughs> went far enough. Um, and, well, I guess that's it. I can't run for office. Right? <laughs> you know, so, um, so, you know, to answer your question, if I had to talk to the candidates um, today, you know, ideally, in the ideal state, I would want something like uh, Medicare for all. Hmm. But I have to ask, I mean, is our country ready for that? Do we have the culture in our country of, of uh, Medicare for all when we can't even get Medicaid for those who need it, right? right. Um, so uh, yes, I think that's the ideal state. My guess is we're probably going to end up, if we go any further than where we are now, in some place around the, you know, Medicare for all who need it. I see. Do you think that, that uh, kind of iterative changes or, or repairs to the ACA would be helpful, or should, should Democrats just move beyond that and, and go straight to single payer? <laughs> well, um, again, I think, I think um, everything that we can do to adjust some of the issues that we have under the ACA is better than nothing. One of those issues, for exam example, is the out-of-pocket maximum. I think a lot of us thought, wow, it's great. Patients max out every single year in terms of how much they have to pay. Well, today, that out-of-pocket maximum is somewhere uh, between $7,500 and $8,000 a year. 
Uh, in my state, uh, again, median annual income is about $50,000. So for somebody who gets diagnosed with cancer in December, they'll max out immediately. Then January comes around, guess what happens, right? So within 60 days, they're $16,000 in debt, and uh, they barely bring that much home. Mm, wow. So, so that's one aspect, I think, where we haven't focused as much on, on the patient burden um, of cost when it comes to the ACA. We focused a lot on systemic health costs. Right. Well, thank you so much, Yusuf and Blythe, for the very interesting conversation. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All things in moderation are usually acceptable. As a wine lover, I always say, don't drink bad wine. Life is too short for bad wine, so as long as you're drinking good wine, that's okay. But all things in moderation. The whole idea behind a lot of these things you see on the web that are either immune enhancers or do things to limit the growth of cancer, such as restricting sugar or carbohydrates in your diet. I wish that a lot of those rumors and myths were held up to the same level of scientific rigor that I'm asked to provide when I recommend a treatment for patients. Most of those concepts about sugar is bad, sugar feeds the, the cancer, if the cancer really wants sugar, it's gonna find it. It's gonna get it from your own body. It will break down muscle in order to get it. Having a cookie, having a donut every once in a while is not gonna make it easier for the cancer to grow. That, there's just no data for that. It's interesting because the weight loss question is one that we typically ask as oncologists to all of our patients when they come in. Because in many ways, unintended weight loss is a sign that the body is really taking a hit from the growth of, that, of those tumor cells. And so I think being able to maintain weight is really important. What I tell patients is the stronger and fitter you are going into treatment, the stronger and fitter you're gonna come out on the back end. Exercise is important. I'm not saying run a marathon, but certainly walk and be as active as you can. Eat a healthy, well-balanced diet. A multivitamin is probably not unreasonable, but beyond that, I don't know that there's any data that says that some strange fad diet has better outcomes. I certainly support the idea of any kind of regular exercise and activity as helping you to be stronger to battle the, the cancer. Up next, to discuss the truth about food and cancer, please welcome Dr. Nagi Kumar, senior member at Moffitt Cancer Center, and Dr. Yael Vodovots, professor and director of the Center for Advanced Functional Foods, Research, and Entrepreneurship at Ohio State University. Here to lead the discussion, welcome back The Atlantic's James Hamblin. Thank you. Oh, there's an article that I wrote, which is, uh, was sort of about what you were just hearing about the idea of people starving cancer and wanting to fast and deprive the tumor, which might be a sort of seductive idea, but both of you are, are working to do kind of the opposite, which is not to deprive the cancer of food or any disease, but to think of food as medicine, thinking what can we give to this person to make them healthier and to make them better able to prevent or even treat disease. So can we start with just tell me the most exciting thing that you've found recently about the potential for using food as medicine? So um, thank you, Yale, for letting yeah. me start <laughs> off with this. Uh, so one of the areas of research that our group has been focusing on uh, is a, uh, the area of phytochemicals or plant substances that are found in the food we eat to be uh, of uh, value to modulate the carcinogenic process. And this is a, an area we call primary and secondary chemo prevention. And we, uh, have, uh, uh, we use a very rigorous uh, uh, research model, very similar to what, how we discover drugs uh, for the treatment of uh, cancer, as well as for prevention of cancer. And we go from uh, s whether these substances really work at the cellular level 
to animal studies and then to human clinical trials. That's how drugs are discovered. We follow that same approach. And uh, as a result of which, uh, our group, as well as several others, including Yale, will talk, uh, talk about it, uh, but several others have discovered over 80 or so uh, substances in the fruits and vegetables we consume have a potential to modulate a cancer causing pathways. And that's the most exciting thing that we know of today. And uh, several of our research groups have embarked on uh, examining this uh, on specific ca cancers. And I, I, I think uh, that is the most exciting thing that we're doing at Moffitt. So it's, you're taking, you know, I, I've been told to eat fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. but you're taking, breaking down the chemicals within them and, and studying what exactly is having what effect on... E exactly. Exa for example, uh, green tea catechins, we know from population studies that populations that consume green tea have the lowest incidence of prostate cancer. Uh, even if they do have prostate cancer, they don't die from prostate cancer, they die with prostate cancer. And this is the Asian population, Japan, China, and countries like that. So that gave us an impetus to look at it in vitro or in cells, in prostate cells, to see whether what is the substance in green tea that makes that happen, makes that uh, cancer not get aggressive. And that was what led us to go from cell studies to humans on looking at green tea catechins to prevent prostate cancer progression. Right, okay. Whenever I write about these things, people say, oh, it's just a correlation between green tea and survival. How do you actually know it's real? But you're breaking that down so you could actually say, no, exactly. this compound does prove, right. does actually affect right. this particular pathway. Exactly. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so th there's a potential to actually be developing these things as drugs, or there's a potential to actually just change the way people eat food? Well, and I guess um, it should be, so I'm a food scientist and I work very collaboratively with human nutrition, with the, um, our cancer center, the James. Um, and what we do is we usually take a lot of the studies, maybe the animal studies, cell studies, and then we translate it to human trials. But now we take some of these uh, bioactives or active compounds that were found in foods and vegetables, we actually use those to formulate foods. So these are foods normal that you normally eat. It could be um, a favorite of ours is uh, candy or confections, and we can manipulate that confection to have a lot of, for example, black raspberries or blueberries in them. And then they go into feeding trials in the cancer center with, um, usually with patients. Um, and just to look at a, a whole different things with black raspberry, we looked at oral cancer, um, blueberries, we're looking at cognitive, uh, some cognitive dysfunction. So real, real food products, we've developed um, soy bread that went into prostate cancer trials. But what we hope is that you know, you have a bunch of different foods that you normally eat, and now you're just going to take these because potentially they can help with prevention of, of cancer as well. But we study it in a very metho methodical way, just like Nagi mentioned, that we look at all the, all the different um, potential pathways that they can help right. with cancer. Okay. So, yeah. uh, our take is a little different. I mean, uh, I think we all get there the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, think that the quantity of the bioactive compound, take for example the green tea, the most bioactive component of the catechins, there are about five substances, uh, the phytochemicals and green tea, and one of them is the most potent and most bioactive. But if you give it just by itself as one molecule, it doesn't work. You have to give it as a, a whole component in green tea. Yeah. So we've developed drugs based on that because we the quantity is so high that one can't drink uh, 12 cups of green tea a day, or you'd be near a, you know, in a toilet the whole day or something like that. So, yeah. uh, and it's also the caffeine content is also very high in 12 cups of green tea. So there's uh, adverse events related to that. So we, we have been very methodical and systematic about developing a drug uh, in an encapsulated form that we are testing. This also uh, goes through a rigorous uh, inspection by the Food and Drug Administration. We get an investigational new drug approval for it 
before we take it to patients, uh -huh. which is a typical drug development model. Right. But using green tea catechins. Using extracts yes, from food. from uh, botanicals. Okay, okay. So we're kind of seeing a merging here but the, uh, between pharmaceuticals and yes. food. And um, it's both... Both of your approaches are based on the premise that food. Yes, right. I guess. In, 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 yeah, in our case, is um, we study a lot of prevention rather than a cure. Uh, I mean, there is some studies in cure, but prevention is really our, our main target. And when you think of prevention, that's like almost lifelong uh, for some of these, especially cancer. So when you're thinking about that, you want to try and have it fit into your diet um, and. But what we do differently than just say, hey, eat two cups of blueberries a day, which is a great thing, don't get me wrong, but not everyone can have access to two cups of blueberries. Um, they may not be available year round. So we develop foods that contain these um, and in higher amounts. So for example, in the, in the berries, we freeze dry them, meaning that we remove all the water. So now they concentrated. It's still the whole berry, it just doesn't have the water. And we use that as the ingredient to make our, our, our products. So now it is concentrated, but it's not the same. And, and they have the shelf stability, et cetera, that required for food. So if I go right now to a lot of, actually any pharmacy or grocery store, I get either a rows of supplements, which uh, an average consumer might think is this is already what you're talking about. It's already out there and for sale. So how is what you're doing different from um, <laughs> this enormous industry? So this is a, a challenge for us uh, because what's out there in the shelf is not tested by anyone. Um, so FDA doesn't have any uh, testing done on the over-the-counter available supplements. Uh, so we don't recommend them. Unless these studies, uh, I wish more uh, groups like ours would be doing and we'd have a robust research program in every cancer center around the country who's uh, doing the work that we do to evaluate more agents. But the ones on the shelf is not we, what we recommend at all. Because the potency uh, is not there. I mean, ours, we even test it every year to make sure that the, uh, the bioactive agent that we are evaluating and we think can modulate the cancer process is really there. So we, uh, there's a shelf life for all these agents. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very much more complicated than buying it off the shelf. Right. And for us, it's the foods that were specifically formulated. Like I said, the concentrations may be higher or a little different. It also is a, a fact that you know, um, sometimes um, you, you did a test in something like, for example, prostate cancer. That does not mean that oral cancer you'll have the same or in another, you know, or in another cohort. Or So there's a lot of, of, uh, of things that can change. And, and just by saying, oh, this happened to be good in mice doing whatever, doesn't mean that it will translate very well to mm -hmm. a bunch of different things. So, um, yeah, we're very systematic, I think, that that's, that's a great thing, and which is not normal for the food industry either. I mm -hmm. mean, this is not something that they normally do because it's not their potential job to, for disease prevention, right? But um, we hope to get there. We hope that that's something that, that there's an interest in and it moves in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to say, instead of buying, uh, spending money on these supplements, I think uh, uh, what we are recommending until these studies are finished uh, several of these studies are in phase one, phase two, uh, which is close to, you know, being uh, finished. But until then, we, our recommendation is to eat as many plant foods as possible. Uh, so really, three quarters of your plate should be dark blue, uh, yellow, orange, green uh, vegetables and fruits. And uh, the predominant plant-based diet is what we are recommending. And I always say paint your plate like a painter's palette. And uh, that's a good thing to remember. Yeah, yeah. So you're not upending conventional wisdom about what healthy foods exactly. are, but you're thinking of new ways to be more strategic about actually giving an evidence-based approach to people with certain diseases or conditions. Exactly. Okay. Um, so one of the sometimes when I interview people from the pharmaceutical industry about, say, something like drug prices and uh, a drug will cost several thousand dollars a month, and they say, well, that's because you know our overhead was a lot to do all the testing and to prove that it works and to prove that it's safe. Um, and one of the reasons people are drawn to buy supplements at Whole Foods is that they're relatively inexpensive. They figure worth worth a shot. So how do, we, how do you avoid getting into a place where we're thinking about these compounds from food once they go through this testing process, ending up being very 
expensive or inaccessible? I think this is available in nature, so I don't foresee it being uh, expensive. Uh, even as a, a trialist, I'm a clinical trialist, I'm a translational uh, scientist, and we buy these from the general market. I mean, we buy it and we formulate it, and it's not expensive at all. I mean, compared to the drugs uh, that are available uh, by, uh, from pharma, uh, which we're not, you know, um, it, that's important too, yeah. uh, but these, comparatively, the cost is very, very low. And, and think about this being um, implemented internationally, uh, it'll be available to everyone easily. And it's available in nature, so we're not gonna go patent uh, every botanical we develop into a drug. Oh because it's available, it just has to be formulated right. right. Well, and in our case, we, we work what we call from the crops to the clinic to the consumer. So we actually work with farmers um, to develop um, or use particular varieties of, for example, tomatoes that are high in lycopene, which is one of the compounds. So those, we'd probably wanna use those tomatoes versus some others because they, they happen to that variety be that way. And then we, we do all the food science, we get the, the, the product, um, we go through the clinic, and then, of course, I mean, ideally, we'd like to translate that out to the public, and that's through commercializations of the products. But it, the, the food industry, the, some of the margins are very low <laughs> for any, any kind of profit, so they're used to that. So it's not, they know consumers we may not buy certain foods just because, yeah. you know, supposedly they're better for them, so. <laughs> And consumers care about things like taste. Yeah. And taste and, and shelf life and yeah. yeah. So yeah, and actually that's that's like I guess that's a that's a good point. I mean when we develop foods unlike some of the um, some of what Nagi does, we have to take everything the farmer does, but then also apply everything that, that the foods the food science does. So the product needs to taste good, has a shelf life, has the texture you want, has to you know be appealing in a million ways, um, and because you want to be able to eat it all the time. So that's an extra added issue that we deal with when we develop the food, which which is always an. Uh, this is an enormous task. <laughs> yes, and yeah, you know it's it's funny. I have to tell you this anecdote. How I know ale <laughs> is we try to develop a, a gummy bear with a, a blueberry anthocyanin or a berry anthocyanin. And we wanted to really test this in a phase two trial at St. Jude's and among children. And we knew they were not going to swallow capsules or eat two bowls of blueberries daily. And you know, we're still trying to get it not to taste bitter. Uh, that's how concentrated the, so the uh, taste was very important. I mean, if yeah. you were going to give it to uh, children as cancer survivors, it had to taste like a, a good gummy bear. And I kept telling Yale, <laughs> add more sugar, it's okay, it's only <laughs> children. Uh, but we, we, yeah. that's how I met Yale. Yeah, uh, and, and it's interesting because that trial did, this is something that's, that's we, you know, um, offline we're discussing a little bit, is that the um, extracts is what is normally used because they're high in certain bioactives. We try to use the whole fruit, so what we actually just finished is a trial comparing the, the blueberry gummies that were made with the extract to whole blueberries to see bioavailability and how some of these bioactives, and they find that they're very comparable. So just this to show that we can actually do, do move on with the whole food, which is something that we've always been very big wow. advocate of. So. Yeah, that's a novel concept. So we, um, you're actually thinking of essentially a, a treatment or preventive measure for, for cancers that is also taking into account patients' preferences or enjoyment mm -hmm. of actually oh, taking yeah. it, not just the effectiveness. Of course. Um, uh, we have time for a, 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 just one question here, and there's already one up, so uh, I'll go to that. What is the current landscape of lifestyle clinical trials, diet and exercise before, during, and after cancer? This is a very expansive question, so maybe um, how <laughs> much, how, how do we integrate what you're doing more widely into a system that tends to think, oh, if it's not a pharmaceutical, then um, it's some other thing which you're welcome to experiment with, but we don't take seriously. Uh, and I, I, the problem with um, doing lifestyle interventions uh, in randomized clinical trials is that food, especially, uh, is not just nutrients or it's not just medicine, it's more than that. It's culture, it's history, it's uh, um, you know, supportive care for some people. Uh, so it's much more than that. So it's the most complex group of studies that you'll ever do if you do 
lifestyle interventions. And so we don't have many of these trials out there. So everything that we are recommending now is based on the silos. I mean, people who work in uh, physical activity and cancer, mm -hmm. people who uh, work in nutrition and cancer, uh, people who work in uh, sun exposure and cancer, or tobacco use and cancer, and bringing all that information together and making recommendations as we move on, mm -hmm. rather than having lifestyle interventions where we, you make an ideal person do everything you think we want them to do. Right. Those are uh, technically difficult uh, randomized clinical trials to do because of the reasons I described. Yeah. Absolutely, and I mean, I think very quickly just to say that when we do our trials, we try to control the diet, the rest of the diet, obviously somewhat, but it's, it's really asking a very specific question about the intervention food rather than an entire lifestyle because, again, so many vi uh, variables to take care of. So if you want to show efficacy of a specific food, you're going to have to kind of concentrate on that. So. Right, right. Um, well, I look forward to following your work. Thank you very much for talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For my story, from surviving to thriving, please welcome Amy Armstrong, the US CEO of Initiative. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Armstrong, and thank you so much for the invitation to share my story with you here today. You know, some people, when they hear my story, my cancer journey story, they think, wow, she's really lucky to have dodged all these obstacles that have been thrown her way and near close calls. And then you have other people that think I've been very unlucky with the amount of things I've been confronted with. But I am here today, and I'm very grateful. And I'm here to tell you that luck had nothing to do with me battling this disease. So I'm living proof that I survived uh, my cancer journey for three, three factors. The first is unwavering love and support from family and friends. Without it, you don't have a support system. Secondly, science. I had science help me navigate through some big decisions. And that created unexpected partnerships with medical practitioners, doctors, experts, like many of you in the room today. And then third, just my sheer desire to live life. And so what happened at age 35, I didn't just get cancer. I was told I had a very rare gene called CDH1, otherwise known as hereditary diffused gastric cancer. Now, diffuse gastric cancer, I'm sure many of you know about it in this room, uh, is a type of cancer or sometimes referred to as signet ring cell gastric cancer. And it affects the stomach in general as opposed to being isolated in a specific spot. And approximately 20% of all stomach cancers are diffuse gastric cancer. But CDH1 is a very tiny portion of that. The average age someone will have stomach cancer if you have hereditary diffuse gastric cancer is 38, but it could happen before, it could happen after. And if you're part of this exclusive club, you have a 70% chance of having stomach cancer, and if you're lucky enough to be a female, which I am, it jumps up to 83%. And on top of that, as a female, it's also highly probable you'll have lobular breast cancer. So I got hit with all this news at 35, and at the time I was very healthy, living in California, doing everything right, eating right, exercising. I thought no way did I have this gene. And when I partnered with um, Sloan Kettering through their genetic testing unit, I found out that I did. So if you're like me and you have this gene, currently there's no early detection. Uh, to, to rely on. And so furthermore, it's unknown what triggers the gene. So no age puts you out of the no-risk safety zone. And some of you may think, just go get endoscopies every three months, every six months, a year. But the crazy thing is, because it, it's, it's, you can't find it in an isolated space, you're taking a risk that actually that endoscopy is actually going to capture something. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So you're really left with two options. Hope that you're part of that 
not the 83. Or you can have a prophylactic gastrectomy, a full stomach removal. I, I don't believe in hope as a strategy. I believe in hope, but not as a strategy when it comes to your health. And I opted for option two, which quite frankly, some people were like, you're crazy to do that. You don't even have this yet. But when you see family members have really painful, grueling deaths from stomach cancer and didn't have the knowledge that they had a gene, didn't have the opportunity to make a choice to go a different route, it was an easy one for me to make. So I had my stomach surgery at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica on April 7, 2009, under the great care of Dr. Anton Bilchek. And the surgery was deemed a fabulous success. Yes, I was his first patient that he ever had CDH1. I think I am still his patient that only had CDH1. Um, and in fact, I was home recovering just after five days of my surgery. But back to my intro where I had lots of different obstacles come my way. As I'm recovering in my nice home in Santa Monica, something starts to feel terribly wrong. And I end up getting rushed to the ER and they find a massive abscess resulting in me enduring an eight hour surgery to flush everything out and to essentially redo my entire new connection of how I will uh, digest food. Needless to say, to have surgeries in that intensity uh, in that short span of time, I felt crushed both emotionally and physically. And while Dr. Bilchak continued to care for me, I now had two additional doctors monitoring me, an infectious disease doctor and a pain management doctor. My recovery was over more than a year, was more than a year. And during this time, my weight whittled down to double digits. I couldn't eat. Socially, I became paranoid. I wouldn't go out because I felt like I looked terrible. I did. And I felt that I'd be judged for an appearance and the lack of ability to eat. And you know, living in LA, it, these cities are, are pretty hard, hard on how you look. So I was concerned about also returning to work. I work in advertising, and that's also another industry that's not quite forgiving with appearance. And this is also an industry where you take clients out and you entertain, and just the thought of sitting down at a table with a client or trying to be social, made me sick to the stomach I no longer had. So, but without doubt, because back to my third factor, I have this amazing drive that has helped me throughout my life. And despite of all, I possessed a tenacious streak to stay on this earth. And so step by step, I rebuilt my self sense of worth, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. This required me to be my own advocate of health. Because you see, because my gene is so rare, I go to doctors and I print out, this is what I have. Um, and there's been many doctors that have said, thank you, I'm gonna refer you to someone else. Because they don't know how to monitor my health. Nutritionally, I would work with nutritionists, at, uh, nutritionists in the beginning and they say, don't eat this, eat this, you can't do this, you don't have a stomach. They were all wrong. And it really became trial and error. And anyone that knows me, will look at me and be like, oh my God, I can't believe that's what she eats. I eat anything. Um, but it took my mental to get me to that point. And then physically I started working out with a trainer to get my body back to physical health. But then let's talk mentally, because I don't think we talk about it enough for cancer survivors. I battled PTSD. I was worried that every time I got better, something would come, come back and I'd be back in the hospital. I was in the hospital for a really long time. I fell into a massive depression when you're on the amount of pain medication I was on and I needed it, just weaning off of it and what it went, the chemistry in my body. I fell into a big depression and I needed help. But the good news is I also fell in love along the way. And so within just two years after my stomach surgery, I ended up getting married, which was an, a great thing for me to experience. And when I eventually returned to work, I am now a CEO of an advertising company. Um, I believe I'm a better leader because of my experience. I tackle challenges from a new perspective. I lead with confidence, grace, and empathy. And how could you not? And so I've benefited 
my career, but as a human being through this experience. And now that I was back on track, despite doctors warning me about pregnancy complications, I decided to go for it anyways. And I always knew I wanted to be a mom, so I looked for companies that could build a DNA probe to find when I had embryos, if they could extract the CDH1 gene, if it was present or not. And so when I had over 20 embryos, we found that seven of them did not have the active gene because it's a dominant gene, so every embryo had a 50-50 chance. After two rounds of IVF, I was pregnant with twin boys, and then I went, I didn't know anyone that was pregnant without a stomach, so I'd go once again to all the doctors, and they'd be like, I don't know about you. Um, and we would go through the process. I felt like a science experience, but I will tell you my pregnancy was very easy. And I welcome both Griffin and Owen, as you'll see on this screen, on November 3rd, 2012, and by far the best achievement of my life. And so as I embraced motherhood and with twins, I also knew that I was hitting 40. And um, ever since I was 30, I knew I was high risk for breast cancer without ever knowing about CDH1. So I worked with Dr. Christy Funk, who's now at the Pink Lotus Foundation in LA, and for a decade, every three months, I would get monitored either with a mammogram, an ultrasound, um, or an MRI. And uh, she always warned me, when your kids are ready for preschool, you're going to have to seriously consider a prophylactic mastectomy. So not really up to losing more body parts, but I didn't want to take chances. And so despite all my testing telling me I was in the clear, I did the surgery. And I will tell you, thank God I did, because they found early stage cancer when they did it. So once again, I dodged another big bullet. And you know, as any breast cancer patient knows, the recovery and the reconstructive process is a whole nother thing that I don't think we talk about enough. I had four surgeries in over a year that had complications. And similar to my gastrectomy, just when I think I'm in the clear, I'm home recovering, one of my very good friends just happened to come in and check on me, thought I was resting, I was unresponsive, 911 was called, I found myself in the ER, well, I don't recall it, I was in septic shock and was on life support for three days, all from a reconstructive surgery. So once again, I had to get the uh, mental, physical, and emotional ability to get back on track, and I did, and it went much faster this time, but at this point, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, and I have a lot to live for. And so today I know in this room, you've heard from many experts and there's continued to be more after me. And all of you come with knowledge to help improving people's lives. And as you hear from them, I ask based on my story that you make room for the tenacious, make room for the people who wanna live and show up, make room for the people that believe life is to be lived. The value of your work you do is so critical. It's personally helped me. So thank you. And so I am proud to say I'm Amy Armstrong. I'm not just a survivor, I'm thriving. So thank you and have a good rest of the day. For a session on preventing the first malignant cell, please welcome Dr. Robert Nussbaum, Chief Medical Officer of Invite. Dr. Diane Simeone, Director of the Pancreatic Cancer Center at NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center and Steve Kafka, the Executive Chairman of Thrive Earlier Detection. Here to lead the conversation, welcome back, Jean Meserve. Thank you all, and thank you for being here. Wouldn't it be great to stop cancer before it begins? And our understanding of genetics, our use of genetics are taking us closer there. Amy just talked about it a little bit. We're going to talk about it some more. Diane, I want to start with you. Okay. Um, you deal with pancreatic cancer. Relatively rare, but Not nearly, rare. Yeah, nearly always a bad outcome. Yeah. So raise your hand if you know someone uh, that you care about that's died of pancreatic cancer. Not so rare. Wow. Yeah. But bad outcomes usually yeah. because of late diagnosis. Correct. Does genetic testing help you get an earlier diagnosis? And what difference does that make to treatment? Yeah. 
So I think there was an underappreciation of the contribution of genetics to pancreatic cancer. Um, we've and others have embarked on a set of studies to just to do germline testing or testing to see if people carried susceptibility genes that had pancreatic cancer. It's at least 15 percent of patients with pancreatic cancer that have a susceptibility gene, even if they don't have a family history that would point to that. Um, and so we have worked uh, with ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, to have that become now the standard that all patients with pancreatic cancer should get germline testing. It affects their own care because sometimes we give patients therapies based on what that test shows, but it also helps us identify family members who are also at risk with the big move towards early detection. Can it also potentially get us to prevention? I think so. I think if we assemble a large enough cohort of individuals who are at high risk, then we have the ability to do prevention studies uh, that are statistically powered. Steve, you do liquid biopsies. First, tell us exactly what that is. Um, it's a fancy word for basically a blood test. And, <laughs> and this is new science? <laughs> uh, well, it, is, it is actually really new science. And you know, I think that the, um, the, the exciting part about where we are right now is we are right on this cusp of a real paradigm shift in cancer survivorship and the ability to really detect cancer earlier. And I think the key phrase there is earlier as opposed to just early because we know that not just at stage one and stage two, but even in the localized stage three, the opportunities to intervene are significantly um, you know, uh, improved. And so what we're doing with a blood-based test, we'll call it that to keep it simple, um, is to actually, uh, I think a little bit in contrast to some of the discussion around the germline testing, is to ultimately aim towards the testing of healthy individuals as part of your routine care. So to do for cancer, what we've basically done for cardiovascular disease over the past 50 or 60 years. You know, as part of your annual or biannual physical, uh, with a you know, relatively small amount of blood, be able to look for circulating signs of actual cancer uh, in your system and, and provide that information back to the physician in such a way that you know, we can then decide what the appropriate course of action is. So, Bob, your company is offering genetic testing. Yep. So is 23andMe. Right. What's the difference between what they're offering and what you're doing? Well, the difference is really uh, primarily, number one, is comprehensiveness. Yeah. Uh, if you think of all the genes that might contribute to a cancer predisposition being like multiple chapters of a book, uh, what we do is proofread every word of every chapter through the whole book. We're not just looking at three words in two chapters and asking, are those three words misspelled or not? Uh, the other big difference, of course, is that what Invite offers is a medically valid and validated test that is the same that physicians use. I mean, it is a test that physicians use. If you get a positive result or a negative result, it's a reliable clinical test. You don't have to go someplace like Invite to get the test repeated to either confirm a positive or find out whether the negative uh, was really not, um, not as negative as you thought. And do you provide genetic counseling along with the results? We do. We, we provide genetic counseling. The, the, uh, the company has counselors, plus we also refer people to local counselors. Um, there's not enough genetic counselors to Yeah, go I was going to say, uh, are there two or three jobs for every counselor? Yeah, there are enough to go around. And so part of what Invitae is doing, and we recently uh, just uh, acquired a company that focuses on this, is figuring out how to use artificial intelligence and chatbots to be able to provide the routine information that is needed so that we can pres reserve for the counselors the serious counseling needs to be done when people are faced with serious decisions. Do people want to know that they have these things? For instance, a blood test. Do they really want to know that they have markers for certain kinds of cancer? I mean, I certainly think they should because information is power and you can then decide what to do with it. I think it's a similar question to what you know, we face honestly with other diseases. Do you want to know that you have high cholesterol, that you have high blood pressure? Um, I think that there's, you know, particularly what, what's key here is that you should want to know, and we, we want to be able to share this, when there is well-grounded science behind what we're, we're reporting back to that, uh, to, to that patient and that physician, and that it's done with a very high degree of fidelity so that the information is actually actionable. So just because you have a genetic predisposition to a cancer doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get it. Uh, there are other factors at play, environment, age, et cetera. 
So could it lead to overdiagnosis? Could it lead to overtreatment doing this kind of genetic screening on a routine basis? Do you want to handle that, Diane? So I think it's a very important point, and that comes up all the time when, in the pancreatic cancer space. First of all, um, this question's come up, should I know? What, and I think the concern is, um, what can I do about it? And it's important to reala realize there is something we can do about it. There actually are two studies now, they're, they're not huge, but they're each, each a couple hundred patients that show for patients who have a genetic susceptibility to pancreatic cancer, if they're in a screening program, and by that I mean annual imaging of the pancreas, that if they were to develop a pancreatic cancer, we can detect it when it's much smaller than you would otherwise detect it, and our ability to move, remove it surgically can approach 90% as a to opposed to the typical 15% that we see. But it's, it's also important to know that we don't make these decisions lightly about who we do or do not take to surgery. We do all of this in the context of a multidisciplinary team where we really give a lot of thought to what the best approach is for every patient. Chief, I, can I make, yeah, sorry, just to interrupt, but, but I want to make, just make sure we have an important distinction between um, detection for enhanced risk of cancer versus actual detection of cancer. Of cancer. Um, and I think that's, th there's a distinction here that's important. When we do, when we talk about colonoscopy or mammography, that's actual detection of cancer. When we do a BRCA screen or, you know, other sorts of genetic predispositions, that's enhanced risk. And so part of this question about should we want to know or not is I really think a function of how good is that test? You know, one of the challenges with our standards of care today are that the, the false positive rates on those tests can be pretty high. And so that, you know, in, that, that induces additional cost, um, psychological cost as well for the person who's receiving that result. And so, you know, thinking about a test for cancer, the presence of cancer, which is what we're doing, looking for circulating markers in the blood itself, if we can do that with a very high level of the scientific term of specificity or really minimizing those false positive results, then the information that you're getting back to say, we detected actual cancer, um, you know, we, we believe then makes that a much more actionable conversation for the physician. Now, whether you do something about it is sort of the next, is the next step. But the actual presence of cancer here, I think, is an important distinction. So what percentage of false positives do you see? So, so, in, so the, the technology that we're using is coming out of Johns Hopkins University. It's a test that's called CancerSeq, and it's been studied both in a retrospective large study population and now also in a patient population of 10,000 individuals. You know, we're seeing a specificity that exceeds 99.2% or a less than 1% false positive rate. How about you, Bob? Right. So it, that's, it, that's a very important point to make because... Uh, part of what needs to go into the calculation, it's not just what the false positive rate is, it's when it's applied to a population. The, the uh, prevalence of the condition you're testing for plays a huge role. So if it's very rare, even a 99% specificity may result in a lot of false positive predictions in terms in the population. Mm -hmm. For germline testing, uh, we still have a lot to learn. Yeah, we don't even know which genes are associated with which we, cancers in we, every we, case. We, we know some. some. We know some, we don't know them all, but the other bigger problem, and one that I, I think needs to be addressed, is that when we, when we find a difference in a gene, that doesn't necessarily mean that that difference is causing that gene not to work. And so a typical germline test does not have two outcomes, positive or negative. It has three, positive, negative, and it's a variant of uncertain significance that we don't know what it means. And one serious issue is that we don't have enough data from people that are not from Northern European backgrounds to be able to interpret these variants. So the variant interpretation is more difficult. We, we, are, we desperately need more data from the worldwide population to be able to do the best job we can. And efforts are underway to try and accumulate that data. And I have to imagine that artificial intelligence is a huge tool. It is, as, it, because the, the, the data collection is now, I mean, for example, my, my company has just recently passed the one millionth test mark. And there's, there's a huge amount of data out there. The All For Us, which is coming from NIH, is going to provide more information. Uh, the more data you have, the better job we can do. Let me come at this from a different angle. We've talked about the, the danger of false positives. But what if you have a genetic screen and it gives you a clean bill of health and then you develop cancer? Have you um, been given a false sense of security by genetic testing? 
Yeah, that, that, that certainly can happen. Um, it's because the genetic testing does not cover everything that happens. I mean, there's a lot of cancer that develops because something happens in a cell that's not uh, what you inherited. It's not in every cell of your body, it's in that cell, what we call a somatic change. Right. And um, we, we think a lot of cancer develops that way. I think... But it isn't, I did want to point out, if you, if you actually look at... Um, uh, families where there's a lot of pancreatic cancer and we do susceptibility testing, germline testing, which tests a panel of 40-something genes if you get the invitae assay of which 15 are associated with pancreatic cancer. 80% of families that they have multiple family members with pancreas cancer, the test will be negative. And I think that highlights that we still have an incomplete understanding of the genetic risk associated with cancers. This, this question of false negatives, which is mm -hmm. another way of, of asking what you're asking about, I think is really important, but it's also relevant to think about what the starting point is, because we do have many, many cancers today that really do not have uh, screening methods at all. And so the, the, the sensitivity or the rate at which you find those cancers is essentially zero, because we don't look for them, or it's very low. And there is a bit of a distinction here, too. I think we've, got, we've talked about therapeutics in this meeting as well. You know, if we had a therapeutic that worked in 30 or 40 or 50 percent of patients, in many cases, we're celebrating that that's, that's a home run. Um, and so the fact that if we find, th you know, in 30 or 40 or 50 percent of patients, we're able to detect a cancer earlier, we're still missing some. It's not working for everyone. That we're, we have a different level of expectation about what that should be, I think, is something that we should, we should think about. No test is ever going to be perfect. So it's, it's a question of, you know, sort of what's the, what's the balance. Um, we're going to take your questions in a moment, so type them into Slido if you would. Um, let me ask you a question about the, if, if ultimately this kind of testing, because of early diagnosis or perhaps prevention, is going to help address questions of accessibility of medical care and the cost of medical care. Who wants to grab that one first? Well, I can talk about the cost. I mean, the, the cost of doing a, a really a full-scale comprehensive genetic test um, for, let's say, all the hereditary cancer genes is about one twentieth of what it was just a few years ago. How much is it? So, two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and 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 it's only going to go down. If, if you think about the the whole human genome project, that cost three billion dollars to do the first human genome. Now you can get a whole genome for under a thousand dollars. So the the, uh, the change in uh, the cost structure for this is enormous. Now, that does not take into account the point you made, a good one, and that is what happens with downstream costs. And I, and I, I find, in fact, that most medical economic discussions about this really miss what I think are some key issues here, and that is it's not just what the downstream cost is of surveillance, is what did you prevent? And how much useful life do you end up uh, being able to find things, intervene, and have people get back to work running advertising firms, for example? <laughs> right. And it's much more expensive to take care of an advanced cancer than to make that investment for early detection. We really have to shift the whole paradigm to the left. Privacy question for you. Insurance companies get hold of this data, potentially. It impacts my health care. It's against the law. Yeah, uh, so there, I mean, there, is, there is a law that, that, that called GINA, G-I-N-A, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which says that genetic information cannot be used for either health insurance or for employment. Does not, for, on a national level, does not cover life insurance, although in some states it does. So there's a patchwork quilt of protection here. I, I should say that in general, life insurance companies are much more interested in whether you have sugar in your urine and whether you have high blood pressure mm. than they are as to whether you've had a genetic test. I will just say they denied me because of a genetic test. Yeah. For I, I've seen that happen yeah. too. And so I usually instruct my patients to make sure that they have their life insurance uh, before they before get tested. Before they get <laughs> the test. <laughs> that's, that's um, let's take a couple of questions. While screening for cancer, could we screen drug metabolism genes so we could manage all medications better, especially in, especially in minimizing chemotherapy ADRs? The answer to that is clearly yes. We already know some of the genetic changes that predispose, for example, to the cardiomyopathy that occurs, the heart muscle damage that occurs with certain chemotherapeutic agents like anthracycline. We know that that's mutations in the Titan gene. So um, the, the ability to do a large-scale pharmacogenetic screen is clearly something that we need and can do. The number one obstacle is 
that that information should not be obtained when you think you might need it. It should be obtained in advance, have it in the electronic medical record so it's already available. If you sort of depend on people ordering individual pharmacogenetic tests as needed, it'll never get done or utilized. Well, I, I just add, I agree with, with what Bob just said. I think that, though, there's some wisdom in taking maybe baby steps before we run too fast. And how much information do we really want to be gathering at once? Because the barriers here to adoption are going to be significant, whether it's payers paying for it, whether it's physicians you know, agreeing to use it, whether it's the access question of how do we make sure that it's broadly distributed. And so I think we should, we can and should go here as well, but let's, um, let, let's do it in a way that's really going to maximize the adoption, I think, and therefore the benefit. Another audience question, if you have to choose a focus, where should this work focus? Early detection of genetic markers markers versus actual cancer? Well, I don't yes. think they're mutually exclusive, <laughs> yeah, right? I, I work on pancreatic cancer, and, and we, there are two big areas of focus we're really working on in the field, which are changing how we do clinical trials and really going after early detection for the disease. So, you know, until we solve early detection and prevention, we have lots of patients that are in desperate need of more effective therapies. So I think we still have to work on both of those paths until we get where we want to be. Steve, you obviously see this as a good investment. Mm -hmm. um, is there enough money overall being put into this field of research? No, there's not. I think that we've historically uh, put an awful lot of our capital and time and energy into you know, really the later stage disease. And it's not to say that we should dial back on that at all. I think those are really important investments to continue to make. But the, really the, the step change impact that we can have in survivorship when cancer is detected early, the economic impact, certainly the human and patient impact here, is I think going to be orders of magnitude different. I mean, I, I spent five years working at Foundation Medicine uh, really helping to develop, you know, some of the initial comprehensive genomic profiling that's helping to match patients to the right therapy, especially in the late stage. And what makes me so excited about this earlier detection opportunity is I do think this is going to be 10 times or more the kind of impact. So, so more, more capital should be going here. It'll pay off. Um, another audience question. What are some near-term steps to move the needle on developing a better understanding of minority populations? Something you brought up, Bob. So the, the National Institutes of Health is focusing on this very heavily. So the All for Us program, which is this a million individual cohort, they are emphasizing and speci specifying that a certain fraction of the population has to come from people that are not of Northern European origin. There's also a big move, there's something called H3Africa, which comes out of NIH, which, is in a, which not only is gathering genetic information about people living in Africa, it is empowering African scientists to become genetics researchers in Africa. So it is a really, you know, uh, teach somebody to fish and they can live off of fishing. So that's, that's another big aspect. Um, and the other is, I have to say, that um, non-European origin individuals should recognize that their health care would be improved by participating in research. Should people be routinely genetically screened, and when should it happen? Well, we, we, we do uh, uh, offer a, what we call a genetic health screen, uh, to adults. It has to be over age 18. We don't offer it to children. And it is uh, essentially all the major hereditary forms of cancer and cardiovascular disease for which there are interventions. There has to be actionability. And we're running somewhere about approximately 6% positive rate uh, for either one of the cardiovascular gene mutations or one of the um, hereditary cancer mutations. And that's not these variants of uncertain significance. These are all bona fide known disease-causing changes. So I think population-based screening is coming and will become part of, but only part of, an approach to general health. Bob, Diane, Steve, thank you all. Appreciate your insights thank on you. this thank today. You. Thank you. Thanks. To discuss magic mushrooms and mental health, Please welcome Dr. Allison Modell Robley, Director of Psychosocial Oncology at Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care, and Dr. Stephen Ross, Co-Director of the NYU Psychedelic Research Group. Here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's Olga Kazan. Thank you.
Thank you. So we've talked today a lot about the effect that cancer has on the body, but actually uh, cancer patients often are in a significant amount of mental and emotional distress as well. And that's what these two speakers are here to talk to us about is possible remedies for some of that um, anxiety and depression that having such a severe diagnosis can produce. Um, so first I want to just just toss a question to, to both of you. Why does cancer sometimes cause, you know, depression and anxiety in people? I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, first of all, the word cancer still has that connotation. You know, we've heard so many years of it being the C word, the dread word. Um, and patients immediately think about it's a death sentence, or I'm going to lose my hair, I'm going to lose my ability to you know, function fully, people are going to see me differently, I'm going to be damaged goods, my future's changed, you know, what's, you know, am I going to survive to see my kids get married, those kinds of things. It's devastating, and even though treatments are getting better and more targeted, there's still a sense of dread that I may not survive this, and people are going to see me differently. So distress is very real, and as much as we keep trying to change that, it's, it's a narrative that's hard to change. And, you know, we're working on it, and I know Stephen is too. <laughs> Yeah, well, so, um, of course, the, the title of the session is, is about magic mushrooms and mental health. Of course, uh, clinically, they're not called magic mushrooms. It's called psilocybin. Tell us a little bit about what psilocybin is and what it can do for all kinds of mental distress, especially the kind caused by cancer. Yeah. So psilocybin is um, it's from a natural compound. There's 180 different species of psilocybin mushrooms. They've been used by indigenous cultures for centuries. They've been used um, in medicine uh, since the 50s, but in particular in the modern era, there's been a lot of clinical work with psilocybin. The most advanced has been in patients with advanced cancer-related psychiatric and existential distress. We completed a trial at NYU. Hopkins has completed a trial in UCLA, and that included 92 participants. And single-dose psilocybin was found to produce rapid antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects that lasted several weeks to several months. It also improved existential distress domains, uh, diminished death anxiety, and improved quality of life. So you give people a single dose of psilocybin, and their sense of dread about their cancer diagnosis goes away. Is that? Rapidly. We, we found by the end of the dosing day, you could see that they were so much better. But when we looked at their measures of depression, anxiety, cancer-related hopelessness, demoralization, it really, you know, rapidly dissolved. Um, one day after getting psilocybin in our sample, 80% of the participants no longer met criteria for depression. They were in remission from it. Mm -hmm. Wow. What kinds of things would they say after, after they had taken it, or after their experience? They were kind of weird and, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and interesting. I, I, one of my areas of expertise is schizophrenia, so I'm used to psychosis. And, uh, but I, I wasn't uh, prepared for what you know would happen. Most of them had some consequential encounter with cancer. Cancer was in some form like the boogeyman um, that they, these were challenging, difficult experiences. It wasn't that they had some big euphoric experience and it felt better. They really struggled and went into the thing that was like most scary to them, struggled through it and had some kind of like resolution. People had death experiences, rebirth experiences. Uh, they were transported back into earlier parts of their life. They met spirit guides and uh, had all mm -hmm. kinds of epiphanies. Oh. I remember one of the patients, um, when I wrote my story, one of the patients I talked to said she, she met like a little crab that she took to be like cancer, the crab. Yeah. And it was like very funny to her. And that was actually like an important thing to have this like moment of levity, yeah. I guess. So, yeah. Um, and what's actually going on in their brain as this is happening? What is the psilocybin actually doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, we know some of it and then we need to learn more. All of these drugs all the psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD, they all activate a subtype of serotonin receptor, the 2A receptor, mm -hmm. and that dramatically alters your consciousness and creates these uh, mystical or spiritual type states. Um, there has been neuroimaging that's been done, and there's various groups, including the group at Imperial College, led by Robin Carhart Harris. There's been another group at Switzerland, and um, they're coming up with different findings. The Carhart Harris group having to do with the default mode network is a nice story that sounds good, but it may be a bit of neuroconfabulation. <laughs> but it, you know, that story goes that the default mode network is overactive in diseases like addiction and depression, and that psychedelics appear to dismantle 
this network. And so that's like, oh, it's overactive. It you know, diminishes it. But their findings have changed since then. These are more neural correlates of addiction or of the, the psychedelic experience. How that works mechanistically, neurobiologically, we still don't know. Hmm. So there are other ways to treat distress other than through psilocybin. Talk to us about the BOLD uh, program and what that, what that is and how that works. Sure. So we have a form of magic in the Bronx. We're at the <laughs> Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care. It's not magic mushrooms, but it's magic connection. Um, so the, the BOLD program started about 11 years ago where we started asking patients what they want in their cancer care outside of their cancer treatments, what would help them with their quality of life and to cope. And many of them started saying, I want to you know, do some mind-body therapies. I want to take an active role in my care. I want to meet other people who've been through it. I want counseling. Very few of them. Um, and just, just to give you kind of a, a little context, the Bronx is one of the poorest communities, um, not only in the Bronx, but in the United States. It's very diverse ethnically, and it's you know, very underserved. So we wanted to really speak to our patients and give them things that would fit with them culturally and personally. Um, and the biggest one was to connect with somebody who's been through it from their community, not a counselor, but you know, a cancer survivor. And we have one right here, actually. <laughs> and maybe some other bold buddies in, in the audience. Um, but they have been the heartbeat of the program because they demonstrate, even some of them living you know, in shelters and with food insecurity, that they can still be empowered despite being disempowered by society in many ways and dealing with discrimination and poverty and all of that. And they're advocates for their community and that gives them a stand. And I, I think of one in particular, Elizabeth, who says she, she stands by a welcome table or sits by a welcome table in the oncology clinic and she said, I have a platform. You know, she's West African. She said, I'm so happy, I have, so, I, I have something to say. You know, and many of them, you know, they're volunteers. A lot of them are retired. And it's magical what they do, it, what they do for each other. It's really magical. And, and I feel like, you know, we can't underestimate the power of connection and support. And, you know, when you think about psychedelics, how it changes the paradigm in terms of how we look at cancer, I think this can also do it. It helps change that story that I'm a victim. But sometimes I've heard patients say, cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me, hmm. which is, sounds crazy, but because they feel, I, I found my voice, I found my purpose, I'm not defined by it. And that's not the majority, but it's possible. So I think the Bold Buddies are a beautiful example of that. Um, I just noticed, so they showed a picture of a person laying uh, on, a, on a thing with like an eye mask and covered in a blanket. Can you describe a little bit, so we know what that is, what, how the psilocybin actually gets administered yeah. to yeah. the patient? <laughs> well, each participant has two therapists, so it's an unusual model. Uh, they have two therapists. There's preparatory psychotherapy about six to eight hours of going before where we take a life review and contextualize the story of cancer in that we prepare them for the session, go over the safety parameters. Then on the day of the dosing session, the room you know, looks like a living room-like setting, much different than a, a hospital-looking setting. There's a couch made into a bed. We have them um, hold hands with us and state their intention for the day. That way they're bound to us. Um, and we really want them to focus on why they're there for that day. With our cancer patients, it's you know to deal with their cancer. For our alcoholic patients, they say something related to that or depression. It depends on the disease state. Um, then we give them the pill, um, we give them some art books to take a look at, and then about a half an hour after that, the default is for them to lie on their backs. We give them eye shades so they can focus internally. We think that heightens the ability to have these mystical type experiences. We give them pre-selected music, <laughs> and that's the default. And sometimes they're there for, you know, it's a very long day, it's eight hour psychotherapy mm -hmm. sessions, so it's really uh, demanding. Sometimes nothing happens, and sometimes very dramatic things happen. They're having a really hard time. And the therapist moved in to support them, you know, hold their hand, uh, do whatever it takes to help ground them. Hmm. We have medications in the room if need be, but we rarely, if ever, have to use those. What, what are the potential, like, negative outcomes or side effects that might happen as a result of this? Yeah, psychedelics are not for everyone. They are what's known as psychotogenic. They can induce psychotic states. So people that have psychotic illness like schizophrenics or people with severe bipolar disorder, they can make those disorders worse. So we uh, strictly screen for anyone that has psychosis or a family history of psychosis. 
people that have unstable uh, mental illnesses in other ways, like let's say severe personality disorders, we screen them out as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really want um, people that also have social support structures that are stable. Mm -hmm. uh, so psychedelics very, you know, can be very harmful, especially if the wrong people take them, and especially if they take them in recreational settings. Hmm. Um, what is sort of the, the hurdle to getting psychedelics or into more, I guess, cancer treatment centers or into, into you know, more kinds of, uh, in the hands of, of more patients, yeah. Well, the main hurdle is they're illegal. They are scheduled, <laughs> they're, it's a problem. Um, <laughs> they are Schedule One drugs. They were made Schedule One in 1970 by Richard Nixon in Congress, not out of scientific reasons. It was purely political. Nixon was concerned about wealthy white people who were not thinking straight, didn't want to go to war, all these hippies, so wanted to shut them up and specifically use cannabis and LSD to shut them up, and it worked really well. And, and you know, it's a big part of psychiatry, like 30 years, 40,000 participants, and that history was erased from psychiatry mm -hmm. because of this. Mm -hmm. We criminalized addiction, started locking up African Americans because of that. Um, and so in, that has been the big hurdle. But interestingly, the FDA is extremely open-minded to developing this. The NIH has been closed-minded and they have not funded psychedelic research for political reasons, but I think that's about to change with the National Cancer Institute. Can you talk about that a little bit, what you were telling me backstage about what's next for you? Yeah, so um, a large part of my funding comes through NIH, but I knew this was an area that NIH wouldn't fund, and so I took the data from our trial, Hopkins UCLA, and I wrote a grant, what's called an R01, to the National Cancer Institute, specifically to a part of NCI that deals with palliative care. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with a program officer there who really encouraged us to do it. She checked above her head and said the politics were okay for us to submit it. We teamed up with a group at um, University of Colorado, Denver, and wrote a protocol essentially to do a phase three definitive trial in 150 participants. We find out from them in two weeks if they fund it. If they oh. do, it'll be a really big historic deal that NIH is funding it, and it'll set the stage for phase three for psilocybin and advanced cancer, psychiatric and existential distress. And you're also working on alcoholism, depression, and yeah, uh, what else? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and religious professionals is the other study that we're That's doing. That's right, okay. And which one of those is kind of furthest along? Uh, we're, we're doing a trial of using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for alcoholism. That's 80% of the way done, 80 out okay. of 100. We're gonna be done in about a year. We just started a trial using psilocybin to treat major depression, which is one of the biggest public health problems in the world. Our current treatments aren't, don't work that well. We, are, we finished up a trial of psilocybin administration to religious professionals. We did that with Johns Hopkins. And we're also involved in a phase three trial using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for complex PTSD. Wow. Um, hmm. So those are some of the main studies we're involved with. And Allison, if some of this becomes available, you know, this or other treatments, um, talk a little bit about your community and, and the best way, um, you know, to uh, introduce new treatments into the community and sort of what, what you've heard from the folks you work with as far as um, how they like to interact with the medical system. Well, we were talking about this backstage, and I was very excited because I think what Stephen's doing is groundbreaking, obviously. And um, in my community in the Bronx, there's a lot of medical mistrust and fear that there's going to be experimentation, mm -hmm. you know, understandably because of historical abuses. Um, but there's also an importance to um, engage minority, ethnic minorities in clinical trials because otherwise we don't know the fit between the drug and the patient and we need to make sure that it works for, for all populations. Um, so I think what he's doing is fabulous because we, you know, I just, I said, you got to come and, and do a little, you know, talk to our, for our bold buddies and engage them. And there's, there's a type of research called community-based participatory research, which just means that you get the community involved in it and get them to have a say in whether this is something they would want to bring to their community mm -hmm. and how they could see it sort of unfold in their community. So they're, they're part of it. Um, and, you know, we, there's not one road you know, to Rome, we need many to help us in terms of our mental health and our well-being. And I think, this, you know, especially when a lot of our patients were, were traumatized. And mm -hmm. I would think, I don't know if PTSD is a contraindication to using this, but it would really help a lot of our patients who are stuck in that story of victimhood and understandably so that the cancer doesn't have to be something that victimizes them but can be a catalyst for growth and there's this whole area of post-traumatic growth yeah you know that's very important and, and so the psychedelics could be a beautiful instrument to help you know catalyze that 
Um, okay, I wanna do a lightning round before we head off. What's the number one misunderstanding about both of your types of work? Well, there's a couple, uh, there's a new one, which is kind of an old one, where this is, that this is gonna cure everybody. Okay. And you don't need, you can just like go out and take it and you'll be cured. That is a very dangerous thing. Th this, um, I mean, in our study, it was, you know, they're sustained remission at five years, which is a kind of cure, but we have to be skeptical about that mm -hmm. and skeptical about anyone that would claim this is gonna cure anything. Hmm. Uh, in terms of the work that I do, what's the Yeah, what, what do people misunderstand about it? Oh, that it's really easy to start up a peer navigation program. Anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> It takes a lot of work, a lot of resources, a lot of commitment, training, you know, coordination. Um, you know, it's it's a tremendous amount of work. Totally worth it. You know, we're, we're we're blessed to have the people that do the work that that they do for us. They volunteer their time, and let me tell you, they're all stages of disease. They're all backgrounds. Um, they're beautiful people, but it takes a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Steve and Allison, and thank you all for coming. Next, to discuss the community embrace, please welcome from the Dempsey Center, Executive Director, Wendy Tardiff, and its founder, actor and producer, Patrick Dempsey. Here to lead the conversation, welcome back, Allison Stewart. <laughs> well, but I'm sitting right next to you. So can you hear me? There we go, hi, hi again. Um, you guys have been here all day. Yes. I just want to say, you have been taking all of this in, and something that I've heard all day makes me think this is a great panel to end on, because we've heard treat the disease, but also treat the person. And we want to extend it to treat the family and the caregivers, which is what you folks are all about. But let's start with back with your mom, mm. your mom Amanda. Yes. Give me a couple of adjectives to describe Amanda. Well, she's salty in a very good way. <laughs> she never gave up. She was a fighter. Um, much more sensitive than you would understand at the beginning. And I think um, through the center, through her survivorship, and mm -hmm. um, my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 1997. She had 12 reoccurrences, over 12 reoccurrences, and passed away in 2014. And um, sometimes she felt she was very guilty about surviving. She didn't quite understand why people that um, she had a treatment with uh, didn't make it, and she did. And through the mentorship and sort of coming in and, and volunteering at the center, that was um, ve very healing for her. Um, so that was a, something that uh, is a, a moment where she was, and we were having a good time there. <laughs> How did your mom deal with her cancer? Was she someone who was quiet about it? Did she... How did the family deal with it? This is before you opened the center. Right. We, had, uh, we were very fortunate because my sister Mary, who was one of the co-founders with me, worked in the hospital. And she helped us navigate the information from the doctors and the nurses. So without that, it would have been much harder. And to answer your question, my mother was very private. Um, she's not a person who likes to sit around. She, it was really important for her to go to work. Uh, the work environment where, where she worked was People's Bank, which is now TD Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, they encouraged her to come in to work. It gave her something to wake up and, 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 and want to do and motivated her, especially on the days when the chemo was very heavy and, you know, after multiple reoccurrences, mm -hmm. it was very hard for her. So the workplace environment was very important for her. When did you open the center and what was the original goal? We opened in two, 2008. Well, yeah, it'd be 12 years in March okay. this year. Yeah. Um, the goal was really to service the community. You know, there was a need in the community, and through my work with Amgen and the Breakaway from Cancer Initiative, it really woke me up to this type of work that's mm -hmm. doing. You have to understand, we do not treat the disease, we treat the person. We treat the whole person, the family, the caregivers, the children, everyone. Um, and there was nothing quite like this uh, around and it really has changed the whole dynamic of the community profoundly. Um, and um, we just wanted to really service the community. That was the intention, and that's now what we want to continue to do. But I, I really firmly believe the type of work that is being done there should be, go hand in hand as soon as someone is diagnosed. And I think with all of the 
people that have been on stage today were really grateful for their, their experiences in the sense of you see, you know, this title, People versus Cancer, it takes a team to get together to do this. We need the, the science-based, we need the doctors, but we also need the high touch. You talk about the support from your family. And also, too, I think, in, in coming out of the, some of the breakaways early on, is that, you know, as soon as you're diagnosed, you have to wait maybe 10, 21 days before you get the result. And that's the point where we're, we're going to come in and help, I think, because you need to work on the mind. You have to work on how do I approach this? How do I approach it physically, emotionally, and spiritually? How do you get your family on board before you get the information? You don't even have the information yet. You don't know what the treatment's going to be. But yet, this is where we can be beneficial and supportive. And I, that's why I'm, I'm more convinced now, more than ever, that this should go in every hospital, every community. There should be a wellness center like this. Complementary medicine is what it's called, and that's what we should be doing. Wendy, can you describe some of the programming for our audience? Sure. Um, well, first of all, we pro provide everything at no cost to the people that walk through the door. Um, and we provide, as Patrick said, complementary therapies. So we do, a, um, we have multiple acupuncture clinics. Uh, we do mas oncology massage therapy. We have a nutritionist on staff who does individual consultations plus um, classes, both educational and cooking. Uh, we have a fitness specialist on staff as well who does fitness consultations, kind of helping um, the folks that walk through our door, whether they're the cancer patient or the caregivers, whoever it is that's impacted by the cancer, um, all of our services are available to everybody and we'll help people. If, if we don't have something that is right for them, then we'll refer them out into the community um, to other resources. We also do other educational programs. We have a healing tree program, which is our youth and family services. So again, it's really enveloping the family um, around uh, the person that has the cancer. Um, we really focus a lot on the kids in a family that are impacted by a loved one's cancer. Um, similar to the, it made me think of the Broadway uh, guys that were here today and, mm -hmm. and what they were talking about and the new initiative that they started um, is a lot of like what we're doing is really helping those kids in a family that are impacted by somebody else's cancer. Um, we do adventure-based work with our teen group. We have a young adult group. We have multiple support groups. We do individual counseling. We have five social workers on staff. We do family counseling. Um, we do little kiddo counseling. We do play therapy, sand therapy. You know, we, it's pretty much the gambit yeah. of all of those supportive um, services. So we think of the patient in the middle, the family in the middle. They're getting their medical treatment, but we're providing the, that full circle of care um, by providing the supportive care for that family. I was interested in the mentorship program. I was sort of yes. cruising around the website. Can you describe what happens when you have a cancer mentor? Yeah, so the Cancer Mentor Program, and there's a few of them around. Um, ours is for people in Maine, and so it's pairing up somebody who's been recent, recent, recently diagnosed with cancer with somebody who has a similar experience. It might be based on their age or the type of cancer that they have, um, whatever that circumstance is, and they're paired up, and they're, it's kind of like buddying up, you know, talking about... Um, experience the person who has the history of having their cancer a while ago, they can really share that experience with the newly diagnosed cancer patient and kind of help them through some of the questions that they have and, and their journey as well. Yeah, that connection between the two is really profound. Yeah. There, there's something that's an immediate connection in chemistry where there's an understanding that's unspoken. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said for my mother and for other people, it's a really healing experience for both. The other thing that we need to talk about, okay. too, I'm sorry to run with, is really survivorship, too. I think this yeah. is the thing is like where people are being diagnosed earlier and living with it longer. And it, this is an important part of what we're going to develop and continue to develop. Did you always know that this was going to be in Maine? You could have done this in California where you work. You could have done yeah, it in a big city where fundraising is a lot easier. Right. We have a, an amazing community that has um, really stepped up. Um, uh, individuals, uh, local businesses, corporations, and um, we're very fortunate. But, it, you know, if you want to make a difference, all you have to do is turn around and look in your neighborhood or look in your backyard. And, mm -hmm. and I got some great advice um, early on in my career, never forget where you come from. And it was like, where can I make a big impact? Where is the need? And, and it, it's also sort of comes from my mother's need. And, and I went, that's what brought it there. 
I remember too one when with breakaway from cancer, somebody asked you, "What's your cause?" Right. So it was right around the time the show Grey's Anatomy just sort of launched and it sort of a lot of attention. And they're, "What do you stand for? What's your cause?" And I, you know, never, number one, never been asked that. Never was really, never thought about it. And and it really made me step back. And then I started looking at the partners that were in breakaway from cancer, and I was like, "This is what's needed in our community." I, I, I called home and I was like, okay, well, let's do a little bit of uh, investigation to see if it can be supported by the community and by the hospital, and they were uh, involved at that point. When you first started the project, who was somebody or some entity, you don't have to say name names, uh, that they, they weren't supportive? They said, I'm not sure this is, is going to work. I'm not sure this is what our community needs. I'm not sure this is what cancer patients need. I don't think we, really, that we didn't come up against that, no. Yeah. No, I think it was such a fresh idea. I think getting people to wrap their head around acupuncture and sort of high touch sort of approach and not treating the disease, treating the person, was there. It was around. Hmm. And I think once people started to catch on, uh, once they understood what it was that we were doing, a lot of people thought we were an infusion center, that we were a research center, and that we we do a bike event, um, the Dempsey Challenge, which is a primary fundraising activity that we do. So it's 100 miles, 75. It was basically to promote, you know, getting people active, getting people out. My mother liked walking, yeah, but for runners, cyclists, just to get people proactive. And in that first year, we raised over a million dollars. So it shows you how supportive and how profound the impact of cancer is in our community and our state. Yeah, it was really interesting. The, I mean, those bikers brought in a lot of money. A lot of money, and a especially lot. in this community. Uh, um, and yeah. the runners and walkers, too. Yeah, I mean, all of it together money. the yeah. whole weekend. Uh, you know, we've been consistently doing that. We're seeing more people now, so our, our needs to raise money are, are much greater mm. because we, you know, it's, there is a cost to these services, mm -hmm. but there's no cost to the patient. And in one of the speakers earlier, you, you realize that a lot of these services are not covered under insurance. So when people come in and they realize that the services are free, they are absolutely floored. And some people who have the means do not necessarily want to take it. And it's like then, you know, pay it down. You know, we'll do a donation. Don't worry about it. Right now you need to concentrate on what's good for you, and we'll worry about everything later on. Oh, that's so interesting. When did you know, Wendy, that this was working? Was there a day? Was there a family, a story you can share when you thought, you know what, this is working? That's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um, yeah, I would say it's, yeah, pretty much every day yeah. when you have people in our reception area and they're, it was it's really cool the other day. So we have quite a big area. We have a little kid, kids area and we had probably, I don't know, eight or 10 people in the reception area. And we had somebody that was doing a puzzle and a couple people that were waiting for massage therapy. and. You know, you start talking to them, and they're talking about what a what a difference it's made in their lives, um, especially in terms of helping them to adjust to this new life um, with a diagnosis. And then you get someone coming out of the acupuncture clinic, clinic that's talking about how their, you know, their pain has subsided since they started the acupuncture sessions and. Um, I just, so I, I think really on an everyday basis, and it really started that way yeah. right from the beginning. You see the impact as soon as they leave. When they come in, they're very nervous. I think it's, a, it's really hard for them to, to step into the center because in many ways, it, it's, they're dealing with the reality of like, oh, I do have this disease. I do have, I'm, I'm having to deal with this. And then we, we sort of greet them um, warmly and, and say, what can we do? What, what, would you, what, what can we do to make your life better? Come in, we'll show you our facility. We'll show you what we have for programs. Um, usually, they're, you know, they're, they're brought in by the doctors who are working on a science-based uh, platform for us. And, um, and when they leave, there's a little bit of a twinkle in the eye. There's something that's, they're, they're relaxed. Uh, there's, there's some feeling of just, just optimism and, and warmth. And uh, it's all through that community. And we're also in an old mill building, and I think environment is really important on how we treat people. Because if you go into a clinical environment, it's not the warmest place to be, and it makes you feel worse. So we're in an old restored mill. We're on the top floor. We have a great view of the city, and the intention was to make it feel like someone's loft space, so that you were coming into someone's home, and it becomes their home. Um, and that, that was the feeling, and, and we've noticed a big change there. As soon as people come in and see the environment, or they come and they visit, that, that's important to them. 
What is the relationship with the medical community? Well, we have to be agnostic. So the last four years, we, uh, since 2015, we, we've been, Wendy has been working incredibly hard at getting our 501c3. So we're no longer um, under the umbrella of any hospital. It's really important for us to sort of, because we're a nonprofit, money's important to us, but we're not about making money. And forgive me, I have a little bit of a cold. So um, we want to be in the center and be able to have relationships with all of the hospitals, not get caught up in the politics, not get caught up in the bottom line. We just simply want to service their patients in a way that helps them get them through that process a little bit easier and give them the stamina that they need, you which is a challenge, which means mm -hmm. you have to reach out. We have to be communicating. We have to understand what the hospital dynamic is, how we can fit in, and then now people are coming to us. Oncology hospital uh, services are coming to us now. And I think we have a similar... Um, I won't, I guess I will call it a little bit of an issue, as a lot of communities do. We had a, several meetings at Sloan Kettering yesterday, and they're dealing with some of the same things we are. Um, of course, in our state of Maine, we only have a million people in the whole state, and it get, takes about 10 hours to go from one end to the other. And here we're talking about a city of millions of people, right? And we kind of both are dealing with the same thing in that not every medical provider feels really strongly about the services that we provide and what it's doing for their patients. Um, so we struggle with that in Maine too. So when you have an oncologist that is calling you up, this is like one of my favorite stories and saying, I need to come to the Dempsey Center and see what you're doing because my patients that are coming into my office that I see are doing really well are telling me that they're coming to your, your center for services. Um, and that's when you know that you kind of hit on something with, with people. So we still have a lot to, to do, do in there, that yeah. area, yeah. Um, but we're, that's something that we're working really hard on right now. I'm going to take questions through Slido in just a few minutes. Something you mentioned, uh. which is really interesting, Patrick, you said the reality of coming to the center is facing what's going on in your life. And yeah. I did notice one of your programs is about power of attorney and living wills, and you talk to people about and caregivers about that part. Why was that important to include in your program? Well, we, I mean, yeah. you know, we've, you know, I've had the entire journey with my mother, and uh, you know, these are things that you don't want to have to deal with. But while they're with you, you need to, to have these hard discussions of like, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. you know, how do you want to deal with your house? How do you want to deal with these things? How do you want to deal with your children and things like that? It's yeah. important. And that also, once those decisions are made, it makes it much easier for people to take the stress away. How can we relieve the stress, the anxiety, the fear? There's, all, there's so much unknown all the time. So if we can get these things answered and things in line, uh, hopefully they don't have to go through with it. But it's, you know, it's, that's part of it. You have these young families that have, you know, are being diagnosed and the first thing they think about isn't uh, really about themselves. It's about how am I going to talk to my kids about this? And, um, you know, that's some of our, just our most special memories there really is when these young families come in, these parents, and they talk to our counselor in our Healing Tree program about how do I talk to my kids about this and the, the relief that they feel as they go through that process and understand better what they need to do in order to help their kids. And then they can take care of themselves once they know that they're going to be okay. So it's having the hard conversations in a safe space, in a way. Right, and giving them the tools to empower them so that, you know, and everybody's different. You know, you, we talk about every cell is different, everything. Yeah, every person has a different need, you know. Sometimes it, it's just a simple thing. You just need to listen or they're just, I, we don't have firewood. We need to get firewood. Our sole way of heating the home is a, is a wood stove, and we don't have the money now to afford a two or three cords of wood. And, you know, you find ways to get it to them. What if someone come in, Wendy, and say, hey, I need this. What's something, can you do this for me? What's something, that, and you've done well, what, something you've you responded specific, to. Yeah. What are you specifically asking for? Yeah. And then you try to, if it's in, or we'll find someone. You know. Or he'll, when Patrick's there, he'll go out in the reception and talk to everybody, and he'll ask them that question, what is it you need? And then the next thing we know, we're, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the next thing you know, we're getting firewood down at Patrick's house to bring up to <laughs> someone three hours away, you know, and one of our board members is pulling all the people together to go down and pick it up and, and drop it off. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> say Mainers are not shy, but <laughs> no, Mainers are very amazing people, very philanthropic and supportive, but private. Patrick, this female, I am yeah. a mother with metastatic cancer. What are any examples of things slash words your mother shared that I might share with my two sons on this journey? 
Stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, stories. Tell them about your life. Sorry. Good Sorry. answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you caught me well, off guard too. It, 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 um, it brings up a lot for me, you know, um, certainly because of that. But you, you want to know about your mom, and your kids want to know about your journey and your childhood, and you want to clear the table before they go or not go. You know, that's a very... Um, grateful that I, I had that conversation. Yeah, I do. And she had it with me. So she was free to go too. Yeah, I lost In my this dad. case, I hope you don't have to would do that. I lost my dad to pancreatic cancer and we had those sort of same because it's quick. Yeah. And you have to make decisions quickly. Yes. And talk to each other about important things right now. Because you know there's no going back and, and one of my siblings, my, my sister didn't have that opportunity and she still lives with that today. There's no closure there. So it's important to have the hard discussions and get it so you can move. You know, we're in this form for just a short period of time. We have something to learn, and then if we can get it cleared out, and then we can move on. I'm 53, I need glasses. <laughs> Any plans to try to expand services of your center to outside of Maine? <laughs> well, I think the thing for us is really spreading the word of what this is that we're doing, and that it, you know, if we can communicate and connect with other like-minded centers around the country, so that there is, um, you know, collaboration and, and, and being able to, if I run into someone in, in, in Texas and like, where can I go? Where can I get these services? Then we know where to recommend that person. And, uh, and that's our thing. So yes, I think we would like to, but the, more importantly, to take care of our community and, and then to connect with other communities. We have a lot of visits from people from all over the country, actually, actually even Canada. Um, that come and visit and want to know more about how we started and you know we're happy to share that kind of information because we just see it benefiting all families um, wherever there's that heart of a community that really wants to do something like what we're doing. Right. And I, I truly believe it, it should be in every hospital. It should be as soon as you're diagnosed, this type of support should go hand in hand. It, it, it will only show you the benefits. And it's really important too, you know, there's a lot of talk about data. So how do you quantify success in this type of work? And that's something that we're working towards and we need to connect with universities and, and be able to do that. And, and that's why we're here at events like this, to be able to network. And that's the beauty of events like this. What is something that we need to think about for the caregivers? Uh, because I, I understand it's a big part of what you do is take care of the people who are taking care of their loved ones. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I think that's hugely well, important. Yeah, and I think for us, it wasn't about, like, how do we do something different for them? It was they're part of that journey, too. And so everything that we offer, we offer to caregivers. So we have multiple support groups. We have individual counseling for caregivers. Um, we also have a multitude of programs that kind of take you through a continuum with people that might have advanced cancers and then through bereavement and grief. Um, so for us, it's really about treating everybody that's in the family, not just the person that has the cancer. Yeah, the impact of cancer in a family is profound, as we all know. I'm sure everyone in this room has been Im impacted in that the caregiver is always trying to be strong to do it, but you need a recovery time. You need time to step back and take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they feel guilty that they, no, I don't, it's not, this is not about me. And it's like, no, it is about you because if you're not strong enough, you're tired, you get sick, then it affects everything. And you need it. Yeah. And you're valued and, you know, that's. Our time is up, but I'm gonna give you the last word if there's something you wanna say that you think is important. Since you've been here all day, which I think is impressive, a lot of people parachute in and out. Well, I, I think. All day, really taking it in. You've taken in every session and had, and we were talking backstage and we really moved you. Well, we learned so much today, mm -hmm. right? You know, and everyone sharing their stories and you start to see how it's all connected. Um, look at our presenting sponsors. That's the top, well, that's the medicine, things like that. And then our doctors and then our patients. And it's like, we're all together in this. And, and when we w work at it, I like, like, like a race team. You have your engineer, you have the driver, you have the mechanics. It's the same principle as a sports team. You have to put the team in place. And everybody has their role on that team. And you're going to get down, like, I don't know if anybody watched the game last night, but it was a fantastic Monday night football. But it was about, but the, the, the lesson here is it's, it's a team that won that game. 
there were individual star players that stepped up when they needed to. Caregivers, patients, doctors, who, whoever that star player is going to be on your team. That's how you have to approach this. And then it takes the pressure off everybody. I mean, all these doctors cannot possibly be there all the time for their patients. There's too much going on. They're downloading data. There's too much on their plate. How do we help them out? How do we support them so that they can do their job and that their patients can get the information that they need in a calm manner and they can digest it? And I think this is, it is a profound moment in this, 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 this there's so much potential right now, mm -hmm. but we have to be very disciplined on how we move forward and either take one step at a time so it's sustainable. So I think that's what I would say. What would you say, Wendy? <laughs> when you do We're happy to be here. I can't tell you how grateful we are. I just, I mean, I do feel the same way that, I mean, it takes a team and, um, and us all learning from each other and not having the ego be part of that in terms of like wanting to take credit for whatever it is. Like we have to all learn from each other and work together if we're going to really have better outcomes for um, not only the cancer patients, but also the families of those patients. Right. Wendy and Patrick, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, thank you all very much. much. Thank you. Come this way. So um, that's a wrap. Um, and what a wrap it was. Uh, Patrick Dempsey, Wendy Tardif, Allison Stewart, let's give them another round of applause. Um, a, a small confession, I was um, texting with our COO during the last um, session and, she's, and I was telling her about Patrick on stage and she said, oh, oh, text me a picture, text me a picture, um, which I obliged. Um, treating the whole person uh, the family, the caregivers, the power of the community embrace was a theme that coursed through this entire day. Um, and what a day it was. We really covered a lot of ground from preventing the first malignant cell to magic mushrooms and mental health. Um, I want to thank all our speakers and moderators. I want to... I want to thank our underwriters who really do make this possible. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, the American Association for Cancer Research, AACR, Amgen Oncology, and Affleck. We're so grateful for your support. And a big thank you to SurvivorNet for your collaboration. Can we give them all a round of applause, too? Um, on behalf of The Atlantic, I would also like to thank all of you for being here. You've been a magnificent audience. I know how busy everybody's lives are, and we know how precious your time is, so we're grateful that you gave so much of it to, it to us. People v. Cancer will be back again in New York next year. Um, thank you. Um, I have one last uh, request before I... Um, invite you for cookies and coffee outside. Um, we'd love your feedback in a moment. You'll get an email from he me. You had um, surveys on your tables. It'll take just a few minutes to fill out, and it actually your feedback means an enormous amount to us. It really guides uh, how we make these better and better. We'd love you to linger a little longer. Go for cookies, coffee and cookies in the lobby, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so, so much.